Welcome back to the Metal Exchange. Justin and Chris back again covering Germany's Vandenplatz, Progressive Metal Masters, for the first time as we go back 25 years for their anniversary of Fall Off Grace, which came out September 16th, 1999. But before we talk all things Vandenplatz, how are you, my friend? I feel like it's been a while. Yeah, it's uh, we, it's been a while since we've sat down and did a, a you know standard episode um, a few weeks now. So uh, I'm excited to to dig into this, and uh, I, I thought it ten- turned out to be a pretty timely choice, considering that the band was just recently announced to be returning to the Prague Power USA Festival next year. So um, yeah, uh, it's it's. Uh, exciting times and uh you know we we talked about uh we're, we're gonna do a bonus episode next week uh kind of talking about our feelings on the the lineup as is currently constructed and uh I, i'm definitely planning on listening to some of the bands that i'm less familiar with at least a track or two so i have some sort of <laughs> opinion uh when we we sit down and talk about it but um yeah this is this is a, a timely episode and then at the same time it's untimely because it took us this long to get to a, a pretty um a pretty big mainstay in the prog especially the euro prog metal uh area over 200 episodes which is just criminal but i think by around episode 160 or 170 i said to myself you know what at this point i'm just going to save it for the anniversary and that's kind of what i've did i've had this on my list or my uh radar for some time because it's uh, there's a lot that i want to get into not just about the album but what was going on for me at the time and some other things surrounding the band so i've been i've been kind of holding this one in obeyance for uh, quite a while, and I'm very happy to, to talk about it. But before we get there, um, after having kind of dissected and, and gone over the festival that we had the pleasure of attending just a couple of weeks ago, I needed a bit of a, a, a recharge in many ways because I was just so inundated with music and, and whatnot that it was when I got back, I felt like I needed a bit of a reprieve from, from all things music. But then after having that little bit of a gap, I was like all in on, on some of the stuff that has been either coming out or stuff that's coming out in the near future. So I'm, I'm just amped to talk about some of this stuff. Um, by the time this episode drops for our non Patreon members, the new Nightwish album will be out. And, uh, needless to say, I'm looking forward to that. Um, the new swallow, the sun album is on its way out. The new eclipse album. There's just so many things in the works, um, that I'm really, excited for i guess in quarter three of this year as we kind of make our way towards the end and i start kind of wrapping up my year end list i heard an album uh, i guess it was about a couple of days ago that i really thought was interesting and I'm, I'm curious if you've ever heard of this musician or this group the guy's name is zeke sky and i think that stands for um ezekiel stembowski he's a he's from the u.s he's a multi-instrumentalist guitarist pianist vocalist and composer and he is putting together this these albums which is kind of a blend of power metal progressive metal and like space psychedelic rock it is really interesting and i bring it up for two reasons number one um i'd never really heard anything like this it's not the greatest production because there's a lot going on but it was a really interesting listen and something i'm going to go back to and as luck would have it after I listened to the album, about a day later, I found out that he's playing New York um, and doing a solo show in early November, which I might check out. I don't know how on earth he's going to be able to play all of this stuff live. So I have to imagine a lot of it's going to be piped in and maybe he's just playing the guitars on top of it and singing on top of it. But it was really interesting. And I thought of you because I wouldn't say it's accessible prog. But the power metal elements, I think, are going to something you're going to gravitate towards. So uh, I'll, I'll play something of his this week just because I think people need to hear it. And I'm not sure it's on a lot of radars. Uh, yeah, I, I have not heard of uh, of that. So, yeah, I'm curious uh, based on your description for sure. Yeah, it was it definitely, uh, definitely different. And um, to that end, uh, another album, which I think is just kind of interesting the new oceans of slumber album i'm kind of in the midst of digesting it's called where gods fear to speak 10 tracks um a little bit heavier than some of the stuff that they've been doing a lot of growls a lot of um contrasting vocals to what cami usually does and um 
again, just a little more punchiness on this one. So um, I don't know if you've had a chance to listen to this one, but this is an interesting release, still very much in that like doomy vein that they they kind of been going for, um, you know, as of late. Yes, I did not even know it came out, to be honest with you. So I will have to circle back to that one. I heard some of the singles uh, that were released prior to the album and, um, you know, uh, you know, pretty, it was pretty par for the course, um, I thought, but uh, I will definitely check that out as uh, I usually do whenever they release a new album. Yeah, and it's funny because they played a show here not long ago, but they're coming back uh, in just two days. They're playing here, I guess by the time this comes out, they'll have played the night before. It's coming out September 21st. They're playing in Brooklyn, um, and they played here just a couple of weeks ago where they did some intimate show in a studio and i think they actually invited people to come into the studio and watch them you know kind of record and recreate the magic that um that is you know i guess a little peek behind the curtain in many ways just interesting stuff and and a band that um has been gaining popularity over the years uh not not obviously with everyone but uh in in for for fans of this band and and for some of the people that have not have heard them very interesting sound and and i think that a band really doesn't have any counterparts or, or bands that kind of sound the same just that that doomy soulful vocals um just really interesting stuff agreed yeah I, i've uh, i've found them to be a breath of fresh air and uh an enjoyable live act as well um good you know just very talented bunch of uh musicians from the great state of texas yeah, very good, very good. Um, anything catch your ear? I know I had sent you um, one album in particular, and I'm, I'm, I'm curious to hear your thoughts because uh, you know we spoke about it very, very briefly, um, but I think it probably bears some repeating. Um, the, and that was the Timeless Fairy Tale album, a story to tell. What were your thoughts on this? Did you like it? What did you think? I liked it a lot. I, I I'm looking forward to going back to it. I, I listened to it once, um, and I listened to the track new dawn particularly a couple of times and boy uh, if you miss the old days of royal hunt and when i say the old days i'm talking about like the first two albums uh give this a listen because it actually features um their uh, original vocalist uh, back when they were still hiring uh, european singers um henrik brockman um you know, since then they've had DC Cooper, John West, Mark Bowles, but uh, he was their their original uh, their original vocalist who was actually from Denmark, like the rest of the band was at the time. And um, this is a love letter to that neoclassical power metal style that um, Royal Hunt has, was just the the masters of, and really still are. But this is almost like it almost sounds more like old Royal Hunt than new Royal Hunt does. Um, this is a, just an absolute blast. Um, and I've always loved Henrik Brockman's vocals. I started out listening to Paradox and Moving Target and was always just a big DC Cooper guy. And eventually, through the Live 96 album, which we covered long a long time ago, um, I got into those tracks from, from uh, those first two Royal Hunt albums and, and it got me curious. And then I actually listened to the studio versions and I was like, oh, this guy is a hell of a singer. Um, and so I've always been really interested in Henrik Brockman, but he just hasn't done a ton um, since he left Royal Hunt. So this is uh, really promising and I hope that there's uh, more to come from this. But um, yeah, this album was just a, a real treat and uh, – I, I, I liked it a lot. It's uh, pretty much everything I like about Royal Hunt um, in, in a, a modernized version with their original singer. So really cool stuff. When I first heard it, I and I heard that the vocals shine through and I heard the style, I just knew it was going to be a hit for you. I, I didn't have to think twice. Um, I'm glad you gave it a listen. I have zero doubt you'll go back to it. I think it'll wind up on your year end list. I guess the only question is how high, and I guess it depends on how much time you spend with it and how much it resonates after a couple of listens. But man, just I mean, really from everything from like the guitar tone to the backing vocalist, like yes. it, it really is just like a real love letter to Royal Hunt. Um, so yeah, yeah, no, uh, well, well said, and um, I just a lot of positive 
press on this album, which um, is, is certainly well deserved. So I, I'm I'm glad to uh, hear and see that. Yeah, I'm seeing a lot of people mention it um, just in passing and uh, on social media and stuff. So it definitely seems to be landing on some people's radars. Yeah, yeah, for sure, for sure. And I guess I'll turn the floor over to you. Is there anything that kind of caught your ear this week? Because um, getting back in the flow, there's just no no shortage of new stuff that's uh, coming out or on its way. Yeah, there's a lot. So I'm just gonna pick and choose a couple of things. Um, I would have mentioned Timeless Fairy Tale, but you got that out of the way for me. Um, I, I had mentioned that um, Dragony has a, a new album. Uh, Hicks and Dracones uh, coming out in the uh, near future. I'll just pull up the exact date here, uh, October 11th. Um, and they released a new single called Dragon of the Sea, Sick Parvis Magna. And man, I, I'm getting, so based on the singles I've heard so far, I'm getting kind of excited about this album. Um, it's going to be coming out on Steam Hammer. Um, I've really liked what I've heard so far and this track's really good. So, um, I, I'm, I'm pretty excited about this and, uh, I feel like this band has always been a little bit under the radar, but they always release really solid albums. So I'm, I'm excited for this. Yeah. Apparently I have, uh, I have it on good authority that this album is really good. And although I've not heard it, uh, I know people that have, they've gotten, uh, advanced copies or promos or whatnot. And although it's not a band that I would go out of my way, I guess, to, to check out, although I do like some of their prior material, the reviews or the, the people that have basically said, don't miss this, it's been enough that I, I, I think I'm going to really enjoy this one. Um, almost in like the old Victoria style, which, you know, give, you know, prior to their last couple of albums, it, it kind of reminds me of some of that material in a way. But yeah, this this has real potential, and if it's uh, half as good as people are saying, I, I, I think we're in for a treat. Yes. Um, I also want to uh, shine a light on uh, a new Vola single. I think it literally came out either yesterday or today, and it features uh, Anders Frieden from In Flames. Um, the track's called Cannibal. It's going to be on the upcoming Friend of a Phantom album. And um, man, ever since I saw these guys at Prog Power last year and we covered their discography... I, I've been just such a big fan, and, and um, I'm so excited that they are going to be um, coming back to Prog Power so soon. But um, this is exactly the type of song that I enjoy um, from this band. The album comes out on November 1st, but uh, I don't know if you had a chance to hear this yet, but it's really a really good tune, and I'm excited for the, the rest of the album. I have not heard it, but I have no doubt that I'm going to love it. I guess at this point, even though I heard one of the singles, I'll probably just wait for the album and I'll kind of absorb the whole thing. And at some point, whether it's with this album or, or, or some point in the future, I think we're probably going to have to do a, uh, a Vola discography part two to just catch up on the rest of their stuff. Um, whether we go piece by piece with each album or whether we just do them in bulk after the next couple of albums. But yeah, this, uh, this band is only getting better and better. And, um, they deserve to be back because right now they're kind of the master of their craft. It's a unique blend of prog metal and almost pop rock, which is kind of cool. And I, and I'm, I'm down for it. So, uh, good choice. Good choice. Um, one other thing, you know, I, I, I'm going to save the, 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 um, the, the at length discussion about the new Nightwish album until I actually, I've had a chance to listen to the entire thing, but I will say that the new the newest single in Ocean of Strange Islands is vintage Nightwish, and I think that um, it really now with the three singles out there, it really begs the question as to like where what this album is going to sound like as a whole. Um, but I really really like the new single a lot. But um, we'll, we're going to probably get talk more about that album. Once it comes out, either in in a long form episode or just have a, a discussion about it, but I want to hear the whole thing um, before I say anything else about it. But I will point out that the band that uh, <clears throat> that I had the pleasure of sponsoring at Prog Power, Frozen Crown, they released a another um, another single from their upcoming uh, War Hearts album, and it happens to be the title track um, and. Uh, so now we have two tracks from that album, Steel and Gold being the first and this one being the second. I'm pretty pumped for this. Um, I am definitely a bigger fan of the band having 
seeing them live and, and uh, getting to meet them and, and seeing what great you know people they are. Um, this album comes out October 18th on Napalm Records. Um, I'm looking forward to this. Another really good single. And uh, it, it, I do believe this is pr- going to be their first released with the band uh, as it's constructed currently. So um, I'm looking forward to this immensely. So we'll see, uh, we'll see what they have to come up, come out with. But um, I did want to mention that a uh, lot of other stuff though. Like there were new singles from Delane, Devin Townsend, Charlotte Wessels has a new single with um, Alyssa from Arch Enemy. Um, just, uh, just a lot of, a lot of stuff that um, uh, there's too much to mention, but uh yeah, I will post a, a new playlist soon with most of these songs that I've mentioned. And uh, if you're interested in kind of catching up on all these singles, that'll be the place to go. I think I'm a little couple of playlists behind that I have to post. So I will get on that and uh, probably make a post on social media just to remind everybody that, that they're there. Um, I still have to listen to the playlist you most recently sent me as well uh before you send me another one in about 10 days so uh, <laughs> i'll have to get on that but um yeah, yeah just, it's, uh, it's, i feel it's like i'm fast and furious at this point and and i'll i'll say this um definitely we'll give the new frozen crown a listen but that nightwish single all it did was confuse me because here we've gotten three tracks one i didn't care for much at all one I don't know that I have an opinion about, and this new one I absolutely adored. And I feel like if the album was like this, it could be an album of the year contender. I mean, that's really how good it was. Um, but now I just don't know what to expect or what this album is going to be. So I'm going to spend some time with it this weekend and, and give it the first true proper spin. But man, I just have no idea what to expect or what this album is going to be. But it sounds like it's all over the map. Yeah, I mean, I think that it w- at least it's it it won't suffer from the bloat that the previous album had being like this two disc thing. Even though the second disc was like uh, clearly a different vision with the you know it was an all instrumental thing or whatever. I think that this album will probably be a little bit more focused, so it, it should be interesting. Um, I'm curious. I'm, I'm even more curious than more curious about what everybody else says more so than what me and you are gonna say about it because. That last album had, so, I mean, I've, I've seen people say that they love it. I've seen people say that that's like awful. I've, I'm somewhere in between. Um, it, it's, it's, it's very, it's a really interesting, uh, album. Um, so it, it'll be interesting to see how they followed that up because there was a lot of varying opinions about that human nature album. So, uh, I'm excited to hear this whole thing. And now that I, um, no longer under the weather and I'm feeling kind of like just finally back to normal again after being in Atlanta and then being sick for a week. Um, you know, I, I definitely plan on catching up on, on more albums. And I will mention too, I did listen to the somewhere far beyond revisited album that blind guardian did. And that was uh, a real treat. Um, if you enjoyed that album, this is just a really fresh updated modern take on, on, on a really great album. Um, so, uh, I, I I probably could continue, but I will cut myself off there. Well, well said. And I guess we'll travel from one part of Germany and their power metal scene to another part of Germany and one of the stalwarts in their progressive metal scene, and that's Vandenplas. And as I said, celebrating 25 years of Far After Grace, their first uh, Far Off Grace, rather the first album that I purchased of theirs. And I'll tell that story momentarily, but before I do. How did this band come on your radar and um, how did I kind of get it on your radar? Because I have a feeling that you kind of learned from them from me because I was a huge fanboy when I first heard them 24, 25 years ago. Yeah, I was always aware of them, um, you know, through you or Ralph or Pat or or, or whatever it may be. Um, but it probably wasn't until they actually were announced to play at one of the Prog Powers where I started kind of digging into their back catalog a bit and then um you know I, i've been paying attention to their releases probably since seraphic clockwork came out in 2010 um but i've had to kind of go back and, and you know listen to some of the older stuff i, I didn't realize that they kind of like go all the way back to like the mid 80s it was when like the band formed um which is is pretty crazy uh their first album Came out in '94. I don't really remember thinking much about Van and Plas until like after the '90s. Um, so 
I'm curious to hear what your random plus origin story is, but I don't really have a strong memory of, of like, I just feel like they were just one of those bands that got mentioned a lot. And so like, they were just kind of, I was always aware of them, but just never really got super into them. Um, but I've become a fan in the later years and I've really enjoyed their newer material, um, including the, an album that came out uh, earlier this year, the Empyrean equation of the long lost things. Um, so yeah, I, I, I wish I had a more fun story to tell. I'm sure you, you can, uh, you know, uh, fill in the, the, the fun anecdotes, uh, with your story. Cause I, yeah, I don't got it, much to much here. <laughs> I, I remember reading about them, I think on like dream theater message boards or, you know, back when we were in high school. So 90, 98, 99. And, um, didn't think that much of it other than sounds like a band I need to check out, but I couldn't find their material anywhere. This is, uh, to import this stuff would have cost an arm and a leg. And, and although they had distribution on inside out, they were just hard to find in, in local CD stores. And I remember being in Disney world of all places, um, around the time that the album came out. And I remember seeing the album in the flesh in Virgin records in Orlando. Um, and this is again in, 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 you know, 1999. And I didn't buy it because at the time I remember it being like either 17 or 1899. And if, for those doing the math at home, that's like 31 bucks. And I was a poor high school student, so I didn't get it. But um, as luck would have it, you and I and some of our friends actually went back to Disney World uh, a year later and we were there during the summer of 2000. And while we were there, we stopped in Virgin Records and the, the album was still there. And I actually bought it while we were in Disney World, um, which is kind of crazy. So you were with me when I got the album, but you just probably don't have the recollection or whatnot. And and I remember coming home with it and just being like, I got to hear this thing. I wonder if it was the same copy that you had left there the year it before. It would not surprise me. And I've <laughs> wondered this for the better part of 25 years because I'm saying to myself – I don't know how the demand was for, for this album in, in, in central Florida in 1999, 2000, but it was there and I spent the 31 bucks or whatever it is today. And I, I brought the album home and I remember going back to the hotel room, opening the thing up. And I think I had a disc man with me because again, this is before the iPhone and the iPod and all that stuff. And I remember that opening riff of I can see. And I was like, holy shit, this is what I've been searching for. Like I was such a huge dream theater fan. And this was just like, in the same vein, but it had that European flair to it. So I was hooked right away. And I, I, I just will never forget that particular story. And um, obviously became a fan of the album. I've, I've been listening to it, you know, for, for, for decades now. And then I would just go on to get all their back catalog. And I haven't missed an album since then. And, you know, I, I, I will tell the story about how I first saw them live and some of the stuff surrounding that as we get deeper into the podcast. But this one for me, and I'll, I'll just put it out there up front. I love the album. A bit of a nostalgia pick for me, though, because I just, I don't know, it was one of the first European prog metal bands that I ever got into um, to kind of contrast the, the Fate's Warnings and the Dream Theaters that I kind of grew up on. It, very, very interesting. Um, that, that's awesome. Um, I do remember Mike, uh, if if I may circle back to Henrik Brockman, Mike bought Land of Broken Hearts by Royal Hunt at that same Virgin Megastore that uh, I don't I do not remember you buying the Vandenplatz record, but I remember Mike buying Royal Hunt record and I I bought the Top Gun soundtrack. Uh, <laughs> because you so. couldn't have gotten that anywhere else or, you know in in 2000, but right. uh, yeah, listen, we 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 uh we all have our proclivities. Mine is German progressive metal and yours is uh, men named goose, but I, I digress. So um, that being said, that being said, have you heard this album in its entirety? I know that there are certain songs on here that probably you remember right away, but had you ever heard the full thing? I don't know. I, I don't think so. I mean, if I had, it was just so long ago. I don't really remember um, because like, yeah, some songs were, definitely more familiar than others. And I think that it probably has more to do with like, what are their kind of go-to tracks live. Um, and so like songs like I can see and into the sun and I don't miss, I, I don't miss you is probably the song I recognize the most. Um, Cause that was well, one. It's also just, one of the standout tracks. Yeah. Not saying it's the best track, but it's certainly memorable. No, but I just remember it very well. Um, so yeah, this was kind of uh, Iotic Rain was another one I remembered. 
Um, so yeah, like it, it was kind of a hodgepodge for me, but at the same time, and I, I'd mentioned this to you, you know, earlier in the week that like, even though it wasn't an album I listened to when I was younger, it made me feel nostalgic. And I think it was just because of the, the sound itself. It just reminded me of like that, what Prague, like European Prague sounded like in the nineties. Like it just, um, I, I, I think we've joked that like Van Plas has kind of stayed the course over the years, but actually going back and listening to this, you kind of realize that they have really, um, you know, grown since this. Um, and I think that their current sound is definitely, you know, more modern and, and, you know, fits the era. And this really, I arguably a little proggier and a little less song driven, if I will. And I think maybe that's why I love the old material as much as I do. Um, there are, I mean, don't get me wrong. This is clearly a prog metal album, very keyboard laden, Lots of intricate solos, some odd time signatures here and there. But the new stuff, the songwriting just got a little more mature on the proggy side. Not that it's better or worse. It's just different. But the song uh, writing and the nature of the, these compositions are really what struck a chord with me. Because I just thought that they were really brilliant compositions. And I think every track sounds so different from the next that you can easily discern what track it is right away just because of the cadence and the different elements uh, on each of these tunes. Plus, there's only nine tracks on the album, not including the bonus tracks, which are, which are both covers. So it's, it's not, even though these songs are not short, it's not like there's 15 tracks. It's, it's a pretty digestible album, in my opinion. And it's it, it, the listen is very quick. In other words, it doesn't feel like an album that you know clocks in at 54 minutes. It really feels like an album to me that's like 35 minutes or 38 minutes. It just moves very well for me. Yeah, I also felt that it was a very um, easy easy listen, especially for a prog album. Like I was kind of surprised that it was over as quickly – as it was. And um, it's interesting because the last two episodes were about, you know, 20 to 30 minute individual tracks. And, and uh, now we're getting back to talking about a full length album for the first time in almost a month. And, um, but yeah, I, I felt like it was a very easy, quick and enjoyable listen. I honestly, ha- I, like I'm having a very difficult time picking a song of the week because I felt like everything was consistently good. Like I didn't think there were any tracks that were that stuck out as like better than the others or worse than the others. Like it was a really, really consistent listen for me. Well, to that end, I always used to think it was a top heavy album. I thought the first five tracks were just out of this world. And I thought that the back half was good, but a step down I don't know that I feel that way anymore, and maybe that's because over time I played the front half a little bit more, so there was a little bit of a fatigue factor, but not really because I still love every one of those tunes. I just think that the album is really well balanced. I don't know that it's my favorite Van Den Plaats album, but if not, it's going to be in the top two, Uh, so it's really close. Um, the, The last question I have before we get into it, did it feel dated at all to you? And I asked the question because... Again, it's 25 years old. I think the production is maybe not as crisp as, you know, the new Van den Plas material for sure. But, you know, you talked about that old European style, and I think you even used the word old. Is there is there a datedness to it, or do you think it holds up well? Yeah, I, don't, I wouldn't call it dated. It's more of like a classic kind of sound. Like, a, a dated to me kind of has like a negative connotation as being like – you know, wa- like a washed up sound or in the past kind of sound. And I-, I just think that this really fits what we were listening to at this time. It just so happened that I didn't listen to it until like after the fact you actually were listening to it at the time. Um, but yeah, there- there's just a um, something about that nineties prog sound, like um, just the-, the guitars seem to have like a certain kind of sound to them. Like, um, I don't know, like it, it- I think if I if you had played this for me and just said like you wouldn't didn't tell me who it was and I didn't know the vocals or whatever like I probably would have been able to kind of pinpoint when it was from um but I don't say that in in any sort of negative way I think it just kind of fits the time that it was uh 
was released. So I don't know if you feel differently. I just think that it, it sounds like a, a 1999, you know, prog metal uh, album from a European band. I think that's fair. Um, and like I said, you could hear better production on their most recent album, for example. But I think the music itself holds up exceptionally well. And I guess that's a testament to the strength of the tracks themselves. Um, but to me, this is a timeless album from a time where the band was really kind of hitting their own. Because I say that, you know, this was their third full length album. The first two albums, the production is really kind of not so perfect um some great songs don't get me wrong some just phenomenal songs but almost like a seventh wonder where they kind of hit their stride with mercy falls and have taken it from there those first two seventh wonder albums as good as they are the production was a little you know a little less than and i think van plus suffered from the same type of thing although i'd argue that the first two van den plus albums are actually better than the first two seventh wonders albums top to bottom but discussion for another day by the time they get to far off grace they are really cooking, cooking on all, firing on all cylinders when it comes to the songwriting. And um, these are just timeless tracks to me. And so we'll get right into it. The band is, one thing I can say is for the most part, they've had the same lineup for a very long time, save one member, which we'll get to. But this lineup, um, four out of the five guys are still in the band. Uh, on this album, it's Andy Kuntz on vocals, Stefan Lill on guitars, Gunther Werno on keyboards, who was such an instrumental piece of this album and unfortunately is no longer with the band. Uh, Torsten Reichert on bass and Andreas Lill on drums. Just a, um, a juggernaut of a lineup that really, in part because they had been together for so long, was just a well-oiled machine, not only in the studio, but live as well. And some of the nicest guys that I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. Yeah, I, I'm impressed with the the uh, longevity of this this lineup. With the like you said, the exception of the keyboard player um, Gunter Werno was replaced by Alessandro Del Vecchio, who has a laundry list of of bands that um, he has been involved with, um, mainly because um, his work with Frontiers. Um, it's just, and I think uh, Van Plas is now on Frontiers Records, so that kind of tracks. Um, but yeah, everybody else. Uh, the Lil Brothers and Andy have been together since 1986. Torsten joined the band in 1990. And uh, uh, I'm sorry, um, uh, Gunter also had joined the band in 1990 and was with them for 33 years before he left. So this was a very, very, um, you, know, sta- you know, standard lineup. Uh, they really, like, were together for quite some time. And... Uh, it's funny because, like, I know Gunter Werno almost more from his work with, like, Place Vendum with Michael Kisk and uh, the Misa Mercuria album, which we've talked about, and, and DC Cooper's solo album, which um, are, like, all all stuff that I'm, like, more familiar with than Van Den Plas, oddly enough. Um, so, and it's all stuff I really like, I, I should also point out. And this is also a guy who toured with Angra and Camelot as a live keyboardist. So, like, he he's... Definitely uh, had had a name for himself, um, <clears throat> but yeah. So yeah, the lineup. Uh, other than like you said, other than the keyboards, this remained the same. I, I wonder if the uh, you know Gunter Werner not being a part of the band changes anything. I know he didn't have a t- a ton. He, he co wrote a couple songs and had uh, songwriting credits uh, individually for one song. But um, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, if there's a change in the in the band style, um, the band has stayed pretty consistent over the years, both in quality and and in members. But uh, yeah, um, I mean, those are all names that uh, I I've heard of over the years. So I mean, that that says something because I've not not been you know keeping close tabs on Van den Plas uh, over the years. And had you see have you seen them live or not yet? <laughs> Uh, I think twice now, uh, okay. both at both at Prague Power. Um, uh, I, I would have to look up when the last time they played the festival was because I remember it. I remember it being a while ago. Uh, the, their first, they played the festival the first time in two thousand and three, which would have been um, the Prague uh, Power Four. Yep, that was Prague Power Four, um, which I was not. Therefore, um, but I did see them when they played the kickoff show 
in uh, 2011 at Prague Power 12, uh, they played in between Power Glove and Evergrey of all of all bands. Um, but that was a cool that was a cool like prog proggy kind of night with the Van and Plas and Evergrey. So that would have been the first time I saw them, and then they came back in 2017, um, and I saw them then. Uh, they had played uh, after Twilight Force on day two. Um, so. Yeah, those were my two. So yeah, they've been to Prague Power now uh, three times. I've seen them two of the the three, and they will be returning uh, next year, um, playing second from the top behind uh, German fellows uh, or Nogan. So yeah, which is a uh, which is quite the contrast there. One um, bunch of of, uh, of Prague and Power from Germany. So that that'll be cool. Yeah, for sure, and and they they are really good live. I'm going to tell my prog power story, but I'll save it to the end. Um, we've gone long, we've gone 36 minutes or so, and we haven't even started talking about the album. So let's, let's get into it. See you next week, folks. Yeah. (laughs) Um, this thing starts off with just an absolute banger in the, in the song. I can see it's the second shortest track on the album. And that opening riff, like I mentioned, just kind of hooked me on the band more than anything else. That opening riff with the drums behind it. And then the keyboards that follow, I was hooked after 30 seconds. I'm like, I don't even care who sings. I love this band. And and Andy Kuntz's vocals, I think, only just enhance everything that's going on. Um, I think that this song, more than any other, um, demonstrates how song-driven the band was around this time. This is a tight song with just hooks galore. It is heavy. And I think that even though this, the, the, the production suffers a little bit, Songs like this with strong verses, a really catchy chorus is just about the most outstanding type of prog you can get because it has all the elements of the, you know, the, the great instrumentals and the great solos and stuff like this, but they never forgot the song. And I think this is just a perfect way to start out not only the album, but a live set. And there's almost like an anger or an angst behind this one particular track that actually plays so well with the melody that it is made for one of their best tracks, in my opinion. It's an all-time banger, and although it's not my favorite track on the album, I'd be remiss not to say how great of a tune this is. I uh, couldn't agree more. I think it's a, a, a really excellent song and just a great way to uh, kick things off. I think the, the keys are very reminiscent of, of early Dream Theater, um, but... Man, Andy's vocals have always been so unique to me. I don't think that there's really too many vocalists that sound like him, and and I think that really makes him stand out in in, uh, in a good way. Um, I, I've just always been uh, a fan of his his vocals, and and sometimes with um, prog bands, like the vocals are kind of half the battle for me, and and so like we're you know we're already off and running with. Uh, the, with the, the, with this guy on vocals, but I like this track a lot. It was definitely um, something I considered for track of the week. I think I'm going to go with something else. I'm kind of hoping we have different choices, um, but uh, really killer way to, to kick things off. And, and while I agree, like the production might not be the best, it, it does sound like I mentioned earlier, kind of what you would expect from this time period. Like, I don't know that there was, too many albums in this vein in 1999 that were, you know, blowing this out of the water or anything like that. So, um, yeah, great. Just a really great way to start things out. And I do like this track quite a bit. And, and it's so different than the title track, which comes next. You go from this short banger to this really long, the longest track on the album. It clocks in at over seven minutes, but Far Off Grace is really a proggy tune. It starts off with an acoustic guitar, just these beautiful vocal lines that are dripping with emotion, but that heavier chorus, um, which will be, although it's repetitive, it kind of very effective. There's like a doominess quality to it, which is cool. And I think that it has really nice transitions. And I'm going to say this more than once today, but there's these nice transitions between verse, chorus, verse, chorus, really great track. And it's a track that's grown on me a lot over the years. I think it has one of the better guitar solos on the album. And you can just feel the emotion behind the the solos as well, especially the keyboards and the piano pieces, the interludes on this, on this particular track. Um, 
they're very simple, but they're very effective. And I, I, I just can't say enough good things about this song as well. I don't know that I felt that way in 2000, um, but by now I recognize its brilliance and it's become one of my favorites as well. Yeah, again, I'm getting like that Kevin Moore, Awake Era kind of Dream Theater keyboard tone. Um, the thing I, I really like about this track is that, and, and, I, and I've mentioned this before, that when it comes to prog, when you get these kind of mid-tempo prog songs, it it sometimes can be kind of a, like a nap time situation for me where I'm just kind of like, all right, like right, let's get back to the, you know, the crunchy, heavy stuff, but this is an example of, of like a mid tempo song done really well because it kind of, it starts out, you know, very acoustic and mellow and then it gets heavier without picking up any tempo. Like it just remains at that mid paced tempo, but it, it, the heaviness comes in and, and then it quiets down again and then it gets loud again. And I just think that the song remains interesting all the way through, even though it doesn't have quite the pop that the, um, that the previous track and the, uh, and the next track into the sun has, um, I think, but I think it's like well-placed in between those two to almost give you kind of a little bit of a, a little bit of like a, a a more chill kind of tune, um, in between. So I, I really like this one as well. And, uh, I could see this being the sort of thing where like, had I gotten into the album when I was younger, I probably would have been like, all right, let's skip over to into the sun and get the ball rolling again. And, you know, not, appreciating something a little bit more calm but um this is a really a really nice song and and um you know I, I, if you if you didn't know any better you'd be like wow this is a little early in the album for the ballad but uh, no the ballad's still to come yeah and there's and there's actually a pair of them really but um we'll we'll get to that um you mentioned the third track into the sun this track always reminded me a bit of I Can See, just in the terms of the way it was kind of two bangers at the front end of the album. But what are your thoughts on this? And um, I have to assume it's one of your favorite tracks. Yeah, I I think I'm going to make this one my song of the week, although I think that really just about any of these songs would have been a good choice. Um, Like I said, I really felt like there was a real consistency from start to finish. Um, But yeah, I agree with you that it does have kind of a similar cadence um, and style to I Can See. It's a bit longer. Um, I Can See is pretty succinct at four minutes. This one's like, you know, clocks in at about six and a half minutes. But, um, man, Vandenplas can write such a, a like a memorable chorus. And this is another one of those songs that I think um, – falls under that uh into that category i believe they played this song the last time i saw them live um but this is a really good tune um i really like i enjoy the crunch of those guitars and and you have like just that the the gunter we no keyboard just kind of laying the foundation for the entire song so um yeah i i think i will make this my song of the week i'm glad that um you will go in a different direction so we'll get to hear it uh, hopefully, you know, a couple of different tunes, but, um, yeah, this was, uh, I think a, a good choice and, uh, we'll give it a listen and we'll come on back and, uh, I'm curious to hear what you have to say about it. That was Chris's song of the week, Into the Sun. I am very glad you chose this. Um, it is not my favorite song on the album, but I nearly made it my song of the week. And and that's, I guess, part of the reason why I pitched it over to you, because I was curious if you were going to choose it, because I nearly chose it myself. 
but I'm very happy that I can go in a little bit of a different direction. But of the first three tunes, which obviously I've given high praise to the first two, I would argue that this is the best of the three. It blends the heaviness of I Can See with the progginess of Far Off Grace, and I love it. The tempo, I think, is more akin to the prior tune, but the heaviness of the first track, it, and, and it's just a great live song. The keys are so spooky and almost provide like a horror movie soundtrack to the song, which is so cool. And then you've got these incredible, understated, but effective bass lines, which um, you don't often get in music. But here, I think it really resonates, uh, especially during the verses. And again, this was another song with just seamless transitions between the verses and the choruses. But what I love about it, I think more than anything, is that you've got a song that's six and a half minutes long, and it feels like there's no wasted notes. And there's more hooks on this than 98% of the prog metal today. And so I'm glad that you chose it because I want people to hear it. Well, there you go. I'm glad to help. (laughs) And, you know, as we move on, Where is the Man is another song that maybe even more than Far Off Grace has grown on me over the years. I don't know that I always cared for this song, but it's really a kind of a powerful tune. And, and, and it's a bit slower by comparison. The verses are very melancholic. I, I, I think that it builds up to this kind of epic chorus, which is very powerful. But what stands out on this track to me are those vocal lines. The Andy Kuntz's vocal lines on this song are awesome. It's not my favorite song on the album. I'm not even sure it's in the top half, but I really enjoy this kind of prog metal, especially when you contrast and compare it to the song before it and the song after it. And there's also these layered vocals um, where, you know, one of the things about this band is that live – all the guys sing and they make for a phenomenal layered chorus live. And on the album, it's really just layers of Andy Kuntz's vocals, but it reminds me of the live show, which is just so good. And then the last thing I'll say is that the bridge on this track just encapsulates that old band and plot sound. And I wish they would do more of that on some of the newer albums, but this is a grossly underrated tune that nobody ever talks about. Yeah, I, um, I, I'm. My understanding is that it was originally supposed to be called "Where Is Becky Lynch," but um, <laughs> changed it to "Where Is the Man?" At some point. Um, <laughs> sorry, I couldn't help myself. Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. Um, I feel like this is uh, more similar to "Far Off Grace" in in terms of it being another more like kind of a mid tempo song. But again, they they keep things interesting. Um, you know, at all times, it doesn't feel like a, a long track at all. Um, I think I prefer Far Off Grace by a sliver, but this is uh, another really good tune. So um, I, I don't really have much else to say that you uh, haven't already said, um, but that's it's a good it's a good tune. Um, well, as, as, I, I agree. Spoiler alert, they're all good tunes. Um, <laughs> arguably, none as good as the next one. Um, Iotic Rain is my song of the week, and... Um, I was kind of thinking I was going to pick it before I even listened to the album again. But at the same time, I was just reinforced by everything that I heard. Um, I've got some strong thoughts on this. I certainly want to hear your thoughts. But without any further uh, delay, why don't we just play Iotic Rain and then we'll uh, we'll get into it in long form. So that is Iotic Rain, my song of the week. I'd argue it's maybe the best Vandenplas song of all time, and I've listened to all of them. Um, You have a drum solo that kind of kicks this thing off, and then those heavy guitars and the keyboards join in, but the drums just set the pace on this thing. 
the riff during the verses is very simple, but really effective. And when they play this song live, I just completely mark out. And I remember they played it at Prague Power 4. I lost my mind. They've played it since then. I've lost my mind. And I just think that it, the contrast between the verses and the chorus on this one are perfect. And the keys and the drums during the instrumental section make for one of the best passages in their entire catalog. If I had to put it succinctly, this is basically everything I love about music in six minutes and 15 seconds. I love this song. Um, I can't get enough of it. It's never gotten old. I don't know that it was my favorite song in 2000, but by about 2003, 2004, it was my favorite. And it's been my favorite for 20 years. So an, an easy choice for Song of the Week. So you liked it? It was all right. What did you think? <laughs> uh, I liked it too. Um, I, man... The, 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 the first like minute or so of the song, actually even longer than that, maybe the first two minutes. This is the German version of Dream Theater's The Mirror. Like it has yeah. that, that same cadence, those really kind of almost spooky keyboards to it, that really driving guitar. Um, it, it, that's like really what this reminded me quite a bit of at the beginning. And then it kind of, I think, develops its own. Um, identity, especially through the chorus. Um, but there's some really like fun keyboard solos, uh, guitar solos, just a really solid song. Uh, again, I don't know that there's anything I can say that, uh, you didn't say, um, so eloquently already. So, um, but yeah, th this is definitely, uh, one of those classic, uh, you know, had there been, you know, uh, a radio station that played this stuff, this would have been like one of the big hits of 99. Uh, you know, it, it's, it's kind of weird to say, like, there's no kind of like way to, to, to take the temperature of like which songs were the most popular off an album like this at the times. But uh, for whatever reason, like uh, this in the, the next track, I don't miss you were the ones that I remember. Like, I remember the titles, um, really well and just i would hear the if, if you had said those titles to me i would have immediately thought oh van and Plas. um probably the two tracks i remembered musically to the most going back to uh going back to the album but yeah i, I can completely understand why you uh chose it and uh yeah i'm glad that we chose different tracks because i think that um the two tracks we chose are very different from one another and i think really showcase um you know, how varied this band can be. And then the next track I think shows even more so. Oh yeah. This, this next track, I don't miss you has always, always stuck in my head because it's like the anti ballad. It's the ballad of all ballads, but at the same time, this isn't a love story by any means. Um, what were your thoughts when you first heard this or how long did it take you to realize how dark this song really is for a true ballad, really just a piano ballad? Oh, I mean, I remember when I first heard it years ago thinking to myself like, wow, like somebody really did a number on this guy. Yeah. <laughs> um, I, Cause, and I remember, I do remember you telling me about this song and I think because you knew that I had a, a predilection towards, you know, power ballads. Um, Boy, I, this song I think has—it's uh, almost like picked up the emotion. Uh, the more like experience you have as a human being, dealing with relationships and love, and 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 seeing other people and all, and just being around, I feel like this song just becomes more powerful the older you get and the more you understand just you know how um, heavy um, you know. Uh, failed relationships can be and things of that nature. And, and th this is just like a re like, man, we've talked about how many, you know, power ballads and ballads, metal ballads over the, the course of this podcast where there's, you know, there's a little bit of an element of cheese to it and, and a little bit of it's, especially with power metal bands, prog metal bands aren't as guilty of this. It's kind of more of a power metal uh, specialty. But there, there's nothing cheesy about this. This is just a guy and a piano and a lot of emotions, and it is an absolutely heart wrenching, beautiful song. I almost chose this as my song of the week, but I, I kind of thought that you might. So, um, it, I mean, if you listen to a third track this week uh, beyond the two that we recommended, I would, 
I would say give this one a listen because the three tracks really show such a breadth of um, just different styles that this band is capable of mastering. So yeah, this is um, a, just a really fantastic song. Probably one of the best prog metal ballads I've ever heard. Yeah. I, and I don't really have much to add because I think you knocked that out of the park, but the, the one thing I will, two things I'll say is one diversity. This, this, this track shows you the diversity of the band and the only other thing I would just reiterate is the chorus is just phenomenal. The verses are okay, but the chorus is is it, it makes its money on this one. Just a really unique track, and I think you summed it up beautifully. So I'm going to move on to Inside of Your Head. This one has almost like a scat-like vibe to it. it really groovy verses that lead into like kind of the big chorus. And I think in many ways, it's kind of the upper end of Andy Kunz's register. He really hit some high notes on this for a guy who's not – you know, this isn't Jeff Tate. He's got a, he's got a, he does it in a much lower register. I think the song is a little bit rep- repetitive, but it's so melodic and catchy that I'll give it a pass. Um, this is another one of those songs that Vanton Plus just really isn't writing anymore. And I'm not sure why those song driven, catchy choruses. I mean, you get it in spurts, but you don't get it throughout the album. Whereas this is just another one of the catchy choruses on the album. Um, do you have any thoughts on this one? Um, you know, it's, I, I'm thinking back at what you had said earlier about, you know, you, that you felt or you did feel at one time that this was a very top heavy album. And I could kind of understand that. Like if I had listened to this a long time ago, I probably would have like gotten up to the sixth track and been like, all right, I'm good. Like, you know, like there was, there's so much meat on the bone on those first six tracks, but, um, it's just like I said earlier. Like it just they they continue with this consistent you know uh, quality throughout this album from beginning to end. I, I'm not going to say that like this is you know better than anything we've already heard, but um, it's just another really good you know Van Den Plas style that you know that era kind of song. Um, I, I I liked it. I like this one quite a bit. I, I think the whole like I said like uh, the rest of the album is is I think. Just uh, just holds uh, holds its weight as as well as uh, the the tracks we've already heard and and you kind of want to have something a little bit more with a little bit more energy after uh, a track like I don't miss you which is a real um, downer like you know not, not not I don't mean that in a negative way but it's just it's a very kind of emotional uh, you know journey. Uh, for a short song, it was as much of a journey it is going to be for a four minute track. But, um, you know, this one, I think they kind of just snap back into what you were hearing, you know, with, with songs like, um, you know, Far Off Grace and Where Is The Man. It's a little bit more on that mid-tempo kind of uh, pace or clip, if you will. But um, it's another really good tune. Um, just, you know, and again, the band just has, they write these super catchy choruses with these awesome layered vocals um just super their choruses are always so uh so memorable um so i like this track um no surprise there i guess i like all the tracks well uh, as do i but if i had to choose the worst track on the album i would argue it's fields of hope i like the song um it has a real middle eastern flair to it um and you hear it not just at the beginning, but you hear it in spurts throughout the song with the guitars. It almost sounds like a sitar um, type of effect. Um, I'm just not quite sure of the relevance, unless, of course, they're talking about, you know, something in the mid East. I'm not 100% sure of the genesis of this song. Great riffs. Uh, one of the better choruses on the album. I think the verses are just a little bit dry, although I think the bass lines are really cool. Um, the instrumental section is a bit meh for me. Um, so I would say it's a good song, but when you surround it with a lot of great songs, it doesn't hit the mark. But again, a good song and um, kind of an well placed because I think the last song I'm in you is definitely the closing tune on this song, uh, closing tune on the album. So th- this is put you know right where it should be. I was going to say the same thing as far as the placement goes. Um... The, the solos feel a little bit more like experimental, a little more like kind of dream theater noodly type thing instead of like cohesive, like music to be music. This was more like it felt like soloing for the sake of soloing, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, but um, 
I, I'm kind of with you on that. Uh, I think I, I, I like the previous track and then the next right. track a little bit more than this one. But again, like, man, if this is the worst song on the album, then the, clearly this is uh, not, <laughs> not a bad album by any stretch of the imagination. I completely agree with you there. I thought for a second you might even choose the last track, I'm In You, as the song of the week. It's it's really another ballad, um, certainly a lot more positive than, than the prior ballad. But I would also say I think that this ballad is a little more full than um, I Don't Miss You because it's not just pianos. The whole band is here, again, with acoustic guitars, um, a, a lot of layered vocals throughout. Um, the bass and the acoustic guitar together when paired sound just phenomenal. And that's despite some of the production flaws on the album. And I think it just picks up nicely as you move along and, and makes up for a really epic end of the album. And then it ends with about like a 45 second piano outro, which I thought was a cool way to end the actual album. Good song, really good song and, and probably underrated at that. I, I had a feeling you might like this one a lot. I, I did. Um, I I like that it has um, it has like kind of ballad esque properties, but at the same time, it really rocks, especially when it gets to the solo uh, portion of the tra- of the song. Um, I, th- this is another really good tune. I think, like you said, well uh, well placed as the the last track, memorable chorus, um, and I, I just think. Um, while, uh, you know, I Don't Miss You might have made for a good last song, it might have almost been, like, too depressing <laughs> to end the album that way. Yeah, and, I agree. And in this way, you have another kind of mellower type of song kind of ending things. I think it works better as a as a final track. Um, again, very, like, remi- very reminiscent of that um, Kevin Moore era Dream Theater keyboard uh patches or tones if you will um but yeah great way to end things and and um really good tune and and um after this all of a sudden i started to be like wait a minute um i i I think i know this next track yeah this this album was re-released in 2004 uh with two bonus tracks i have to say these are two of my favorite covers of all time Back to back. And I don't know if you had a chance to hear both of them. The first one I know you're familiar with because we've talked about it on the podcast. Um, and that's Vanden Plas's cover of Dawkins' Kiss of Death. A great Dawkins song and just a f- fabulous cover. I think this is one of the best covers ever. It retains the original feel almost to a T of, of, of the classic Dawkins track, but at the same time adds that progressive flair to it. I just think it's a fantastic cover tune and the next track is uh, a sting cover shape of my heart with another proggy flair to it and i just thought it was exceptionally well done and reimagined um this band does great acoustic tracks does great covers in addition to their own material and it's just definitely worth noting how um although not part of the album proper they did just such a nice job with um with, with these two covers, and I, I think they're well, well worth listening to as well. I couldn't agree more. Um, Kiss of Death is just a great tune. Um, I love the original by Dokken, and I really enjoyed this version. Like you said, they they kept the soul of the song, but gave it their little Van and Plas flourishes um, with you know the keyboards and and uh, Andy's vocals, um, you know, but staying uh, you know true to the original. Material, so yeah, great cover. Um, I will say, I, I'm a fan of Sting. Um, a big fan of the Police, but I'm a fan of Sting and a lot of his solo songs. I was not familiar with the song "Shape of My Heart." Really? Okay. It was from it was from Sting's 90, 1993 album Ten Summoners Tales," and you know, I the songs I remember were uh, "If I Ever Lose My Faith in You" and "Fields of Gold." I think were the two really big hits from that album but there were like six i believe five or six um single like big hit singles from this album this was probably like the um the epitome of of the sting solo uh era after he had left the police um p.s uh fortress around your heart best 
arguably best Sting or Police song of all time. I would love to hear a metal band uh, take on that track. That is such a good tune. But um, I think that had you played this song for me, I would have said this sounds like a Sting song. Had I nice. never, had I not known it, it just has that kind of um, that that '90s Sting kind of feel to it. Just like you know that. Uh, you know, fields of gold. Like um, I forgot what that song was that they that uh, they used in the, J- the Jaguar commercials. Knops always used to um, make jokes about it. There was uh, it was one of the one of the songs that Sting. Oh, Desert Rose, I think it was that uh, kind of like that really almost easy listening like spa like spa music kind of thing. <laughs> but I, I love what they did with this cover. I, I definitely would. Um, urge anybody to, to check it out, especially if you're a fan of Sting and Vandenplas. I, I imagine there's not a ton of crossover there, but you know, if you, <laughs> if you happen to like both, give this track a listen. Um, yeah. You know, it's funny. They, they, they have these two great covers and I've, I've been fortunate enough to see the band live four times. And one of those sets at Prague power, they did the Saturday afternoon acoustic show. And I was just going back and looking at the set list. They did a Jethro Tull cover. They kicked off the show with Locomotive Breath. Um, they played Boat on a River by Styx. They played Music by John Miles. They did Mr. Bo Jangles, um, Gethsemane by Andrew Lloyd Webber, uh, and Dance with Somebody to end the set. They, they are just very creative with their covers. And every time I hear them do a, a cover, it's really, really good. And they played, obviously, some of their other songs in an acoustic style, But, uh, yeah, that was a special, special set. I wish I could go back in time and see it again. But I just wanted to tell one quick story before we kind of rank this album. I remember when they announced the lineup for Prog Power 4, the year after that you and I went for the first time and Vandenplas was announced. If I'm being honest, I think for me at the time, they might have been a bigger draw than Nightwish, who was also playing the festival at that time. I was just so amped to see these guys. And... I had vivid, vivid memories of, of this set and, and some of the things surrounding it. First and foremost, um, go, dating myself a bit here, but going back to 2003, the guys from Vandenplas who were visiting the States, I think for the first time, all had V8, they had a VHS camera. And so that we were walking from the Artmore to the venue and we happened to see the guys from Vandenplas and they were kind of just video recording. Atlanta, right? And so Pat and I started talking to them and they started interviewing us on the VHS cassette. And I would simply kill for that footage because I have no idea what I said. I was stone cold sober, but I was 20 years old or whatever. And um, I just have such vivid memories of them recording us and having a conversation. It was like an impromptu interview on the streets of Atlanta. Uh, and if that footage ever came to light, I would just be absolutely floored. And I'll tell one other anecdote. The show itself was just flawless. And I remember the sound quality being so good and being so impressed by the backing vocals that the band kind of employed because they were really high up in the mix and it just made for a very full sound. And uh, without revealing names, I'll just say this because I think enough time has passed that we don't have to worry about the statute of limitations. Somebody we know, uh, a mutual friend or acquaintance, recorded a lot of the sets that year. And this I've never talked about on the podcast or with many people, but I actually have an audio recording from a number of the bands at Prog Power 4 and Vandenplas being one of them. And it's one of my favorite bootlegs of all time because it sounded so good. Um, and so I don't know if there's any interest in this. And I think enough time has passed that I can safely do this. But if, 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 People on the Patreon are interested in hearing their set at Prog Power Four um, in all its uncut glory. I'd be more than happy to, uh, you know, upload that and share um, with our Patreon members because it is one of my favorite bootlegs of all time, and I haven't listened to it in probably 15 years, so I'm due to dig it out anyway. But it was really cool to relive this set because it was the only way I was ever going to do that. And I have some others from the festival as well, but this one in particular is, is noteworthy, at least to me. You know, I'm glad you told that camcorder story because I had a story that I wanted to share when we did the Evergrey Inner Circle episode, and I completely blanked and forgot to bring it up. And so I'm just going to tell it now, all of uh, four months later after the fact. <laughs> but um, when, uh, you know, it's there's a very good chance that this happened to be the same 
year that Evergrey and, and Van and Plas played uh, on the same Thursday night. Um, and, and after the fact, somehow Power Glove got added onto that. Uh, they were granted a 30 minute open slot on Thursday night, which was really kind of a fish out of water uh, band to have open for Van and Plas and Evergrey. But anyway, I believe that was one of the first times I had seen Evergrey. And if, if memory serves, it was, they had also played a show in the vendor room on Wednesday as kind of like a warm up, which wasn't a thing that was typically done or, or, or like ha- has been done again, really. Uh, but anyway, we were waiting in line to get into the venue on one of the days and it was me and, and Caleb and, uh, probably you and Pat at the time. And the guys from Evergrade were doing something similar. They had a, a camcorder and they were asking people questions or whatever. And, you know, suffice it to say, me and Caleb had had a few drinks up up at that point because, you know, it was probably, you know, 2.30 in the afternoon. And what <laughs> else are you going to do when you're, you know, 26 years old or whatever, however old we were, whatever, 28, 29 last year. Um, so... So they just, they stick this camera in, in Caleb and I's face. And, and let's face it, neither one of us are the biggest Evergrey fans in the world. But, you know, we were going to ham it up for the camera, maybe, you know, be a little nicer. And, and I was like, yeah, yeah, we love Evergrey. Evergrey's great. You know, we're hoping to end up on a DVD. And uh, <laughs> and Caleb really hammed it up and just was like, yeah, man, Evergrey changed my life. And I was like, oh, God, where, where's he going with this? And, and um, I couldn't, to this day, I have no idea who was filming this. It could have been Tom England. Who, know, who the hell knows? <laughs> but uh, he goes, oh, yeah, what's your favorite Evergrey album? And Caleb just stared blank no no response it was absolutely perfect you just had no you could not think of you could not think of an album so i was like so finally he goes he goes oh man i just like them all and i'm like no nah, come on t- in search of truth is just, it, was, it was it was so it was just so like hilariously awkward but uh i had meant to tell that story four months ago. So thank you for jogging my memory. Uh, oh, happy to do it. The, the old camcorder stories, they get a lot of mileage, but uh, yeah, I'm glad you indulged me with this one. I think it was a, a certainly a fun listen and it just made me excited to see them again next year, regardless of what they play, because they are so good live. Um, scale of one to 10. What are you giving far off grace? I will give it an 8.25. I, I thought it was just a really very good album. Start to finish. Not much in the way of lulls or, or any any like you know weak spots, uh, but also nothing that really I think like blew away the rest of the album. It was just really really consistent start to finish. Um, I like this one a lot, and this is the kind of like prog metal, particularly from this era, that I really gravitate towards and enjoy. So I trust you'll be seeing them next year. Oh yeah, I'm actually quite excited about it because um, the last time I saw them, I was. Uh, relatively hungover, and I don't think I really enjoyed it as much as I probably could have. And I even remember you had said that you didn't think that of all the times you saw them that it was their best performance. And no, I, don't know I think it was the was... weakest of the four, to be honest with you. Okay, but... like, and I don't know if that was a a mixed situation or or whatever. But um, yeah, I I just uh, I remember it. I remember sitting for it and not being incredibly blown away so i'm looking forward to seeing them again enough time has passed where it really actually feels kind of fresh uh to see them play and they and they've released quite a bit of new material since then so there's some new stuff that i'd be looking forward to hearing as well as uh old stuff they kind of remind me of like an epica or an amorphous where you can kind of pick and choose from anywhere in the discography and and there's really not a lot of like weak points in time so yeah uh, good I, I'm, person. I, I'm definitely definitely in that camp with you i look forward to seeing them this album is a nine for me a little bit of nostalgia maybe but really you got for me eight fantastic tracks one track that's a little bit less than and a little bit of a knock for the production but still a very enjoyable listen and an all-time great prog metal album for me and one of those seminal albums when i was growing up that really kind of shaped my taste for the next 25 years so happy anniversary to far off grace um i'm sure it will not be the last time that we cover a vanden plus album on the podcast i just hope that it doesn't take another 220 plus <laughs> episodes to get there um before we get to your album for next week and i feel like it's been a while so i'm curious 
as to what you're going to choose. Just a couple of news items, and, and there's a lot of news because we haven't done this in a while, but I'm going to keep it short and sweet just because um, – there's a lot to go over, but Metallica back on tour with Pantera and Limp Biscuit doing the rest of their M72 shows in North America, um, starting April 12th in Las Vegas, doing a bunch of shows on the weekends uh, through June 29th in Denver, Colorado. Um, the closest they come to the Northeast is in Philadelphia. I don't think I'm going to get there for that, but if they can come back you know, in the area, I'd be very, very happy to see Metallica. I haven't seen them in well over 20 years, so... Um, Metallica back on tour and another band that has announced the next leg of their new tour while currently on tour and playing a completely different set list. And that's Iron Maiden. They've announced the 50th anniversary run for your lives world tour in 2025, um, doing a run of shows throughout Europe. And I'm sure coming to North America shortly thereafter, uh, it looks like they're going to focus on everything from Iron Maiden to fear of the dark. So really that classic era of Iron Maiden, which a lot of fans clamor for. I don't know if it's going to be a greatest hit set. I don't know if they're going to go a little deeper into the discography, but um, I, I don't know how you don't go see that just because it's Iron Maiden. They're great live. And um, as, as some would say, it doesn't have the bloat that some of the new material has for some. So really cool for them. I'm looking forward to that. Um, a little bit of disappointing news, Opeth, their new album, The Last Will and Testament, which we've talked about briefly on the podcast with the new single that came out with the growls and everything else. They had to push it back to November 22nd because of delays in the manufacturing process. So we're going to have to wait at least another six weeks for that album. But we'll, get it, <laughs> we'll get it in before the end of the year, to say the least. And then finally, uh, Volbeat, a band we have not talked about on the podcast. They're going back in the studio to record their ninth studio album with Jacob Hansen. So um, their last album was came out in 2021. It was called Servant of the Mind. This album tentatively due to be released next year. So new music from Volbeat on the way. Um, with that all said, what am I listening to next week? Uh, this is an album that I've had... Uh, pinned for a long time and I actually was uh, originally saving it for the end of the year until I realized that the anniversary date I had was wrong um, but we're actually going to go back to the exact same year we were already in in 1999 uh, and talk about Camelot's The Fourth Legacy album which uh, is we haven't celebrated. covered this? We have not We've, uh, I'm talked shocked I believe uh, we did Karma, and I believe that was the only uh, Camelot album we've ever done. We've only really? done one album, and that was uh, two and a half years ago. So uh, the timing felt right. The album's celebrating an anniversary. Um, I So Wikipedia has the anniversary is September. Um, Metal Archives has it in December. But I went to Camelot's website, and Camelot's website says September. So I'm going by the horse's mouth on this one um oh man this is gonna be good because this this is an album that has been pretty much forgotten about by the band um so Which i am is an very absolute excited. sin and i'm saying it now and i'll say it again next week absolute bullshit that they don't play stuff off of this album there are tracks on here that are not their best or not not their most famous tracks which i would put up against any camelot song they've done in the last 20 years but i digress yeah. Yeah, so we'll do another 20, uh, 25th anniversary album. It'll be a little I can't believe bit... These, I can't believe these two albums came out three days apart. Yeah, uh, it's crazy. Um, I believe uh, we're, we're speaking to each other on Thursday. I believe today is the actual anniversary of the Camelot release. So it'll be a little bit after the fact, but close enough. But I, I had really wanted to talk about this. And this was one of the anniversary albums I had planned for this year. Um, and I have one other one that I have planned. Um, actually, I might have two um, for, uh, for the rest of, of 2024. Um, not necessarily from 1999, but um, an, uh, an anniversary of with a five or a zero at the end uh, <laughs> to, to say to say uh, to give you a very vague hint. Um, but um, huh. I, I haven't listened to this album in ages, so I'm looking forward to revisiting it it was my first camelot album i want to say it might have been yours as well um but i uh i remember how i got it and i will tell that story um but um 
yeah, uh, looking forward to this. And, uh, and then the following week we will, uh, we'll do a request from our friend Patrick Celsus. So, and we'll reveal that album next week. Excellent. 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 Um, great choice. I haven't listened to this in a while, but I can almost hear it in my head as I, as I say that. So, um, good stuff. Thanks to all of our fans and thank you to all of our Patreon members. We really sincerely appreciate the support. Do consider joining if you haven't yet. For everybody else, give us a like and a follow if you are not inclined to join the Patreon because at the very least, it does help other people find the show. Um, this was fun, my friend. It's been a while. We've actually gone a little bit long for a uh, regular episode for us, but um, long overdue because it's been a while. So I look forward to talking all things Camelot next week and then going into um, the month of October on a high note. So thank you very much to everyone. Enjoy the week, and we will check in with you very soon. We'll, we'll, we'll see if October is as weird as it was last year. We had a very weird stretch of albums in October, so we'll see uh, We'll see if that uh, follows suit this year. Uh, yeah, to say the least. I mean, it was a spooky year, but um, gave it a whole new meaning. So uh, we'll see what happens, but uh, enjoy the week, my friend, and I will talk to you soon. Take care, buddy.